Good morning. It's good to see each of you here today. If you're visiting with us, we want to especially welcome you to our worship this morning. Uh, I know I don't look like Tyler. <laughs> He's under the weather still. Uh, and so uh, yesterday, about 6.30, Jack texted me and said, uh, hey, uh, we're going to need you uh, tomorrow. Of course, it was April Fool's yesterday, and I thought, well, I'll just wait for that follow-up <laughs> message. Maybe Jack's just playing a, a, a cruel April Fool's joke, but no, uh, he didn't. And so I looked outside, and sure enough, there was the <laughs> signal that said, uh, we're going to need you to go ahead and fill in for Tyler today. Uh, we certainly do hope Tyler uh, is better soon, uh, and that's our prayer as well, that, that God will give him the, the healing that he needs so he can get back on his feet and be here uh, with us again. In the late 1970s, there was a group of Vietnam veterans that got together and decided that a memorial needed to be built to honor those who had served in Vietnam. But more specifically, it was to honor those who had paid that supreme sacrifice, who had given their lives in service to our country. And so they got themselves organized. Uh, they collected the necessary funds that they needed. President Carter allotted them a portion of land on the mall there in Washington, D.C. And finally, all they needed was a design for this memorial. And so they held a contest of sorts in that they allowed people to submit designs for the memorial. But it wasn't a free-for-all, where they stipulated that the memorial had to meet four criteria. First of all, it had to be reflective and contemplative. It had to be harmonious with the site where it was going to be built. It had to have all of the names of the dead and missing inscribed upon it. And then finally, it could make no political statement about the war one way or the other. When all was said and done, they'd received over 900 entries. But they finally selected one that had been submitted by a 21-year-old architecture student from Yale University. And on Veterans Day in 1982, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial was dedicated. But most people simply know it as the wall. Perhaps you've been there, maybe you've seen uh, the memorial. But I can tell you firsthand... It fits all of four of those criteria. It is reflective and contemplative. You can't help but stand in front of those granite panels and you see all of the names that are inscribed on those panels. And, and you think about the people that served, the comrades that people had, the people that didn't come home. You contemplate the loss of so many lives and the suffering of so many families. It is harmonious with the site. It's built there in between the Washington Monument, the Lincoln uh, Memorial there. A very peaceful, very tra uh, tranquil place to reflect and to think. There are over 58,000 names that are inscribed on those granite panels. And finally, it doesn't make any political statement about the war. It's just a place where people can go and try and draw some comfort and healing and remember a husband, a father, a son, a daughter. It's a very somber place. And I would suggest to you, if you're not moved when you stand in front of that memorial, if it doesn't move you within, I would suggest one of two things. Either you don't really comprehend what that memorial means, or you just don't care. Well, this morning, I don't want to dwell on that memorial. I want us to talk about the greatest memorial that's ever been given to man. And that's the one that we just finished. The Lord's Supper. And what I want us to do this morning is to look at the communion in light of those four criteria uh, that we just talked about. And hopefully by the end of the lesson we'll have perhaps a deeper appreciation, a stronger uh, appreciation and understanding of what it is that we do every Lord's Day, every first day of the week. As we read so often in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse 23, the Bible tells us, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you uh, drink it, in remembrance of me. That's the whole point of communion, of the Lord's Supper, is to remember. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. 
And so that's really what this first criteria is all about. It has to be reflective and contemplative. To say that something is, is reflective, it, it expresses uh, an analytical deliberation about the past experience, about something that's just happened, often as a process of second thought or reappraisal of a particular occurrence. Uh, that's a complicated way of saying you just think about the event, like the details of the event, what it is that happened in that event. But to say that it's contemplative, oh, you've got to dig deeper than just the details of the event. Contemplative implies a slow and directed consideration of a lofty object of thought, a physical object, with conscious intent of better understanding or spiritual enrichment. And so when we come to the communion, the first part, Jesus took that bread and he said, take it, this is my body. When I reflect on the body of Christ, one of the first places my mind goes is the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus, kneeling before the Father, begging to the Father. Luke 22, and verse 41, he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. And being in agony, he was praying fervently. And his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. When I reflect on the body of Christ, I remember what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. I'm poured out like wax. My heart is, is, is uh, I'm poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaves to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look. They stare at me. They divide my garments among them. For my clothing, they cast lots. When I reflect on the body of Christ, I remember John chapter 19 and verse 1. Pilate then took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put a, ro a purple robe on him. And they began to come up and say to him, Hail, King of the Jews! And to give him slaps in the face. He goes on in verse 17. They took Jesus therefore. And he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull which in Hebrew is called Golgotha, and there they crucified him with two other men, one on either side, and Jesus in between. There's so much to reflect on just about the body, the details. Ah, but when you contemplate the body of Christ, now you've got to go a lot deeper than that. Because you see, when you contemplate the body of Christ, it wasn't just any body. No, when you contemplate the body of Christ, the first thing I think of is John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him and apart from Him, nothing is coming to being that's coming to being. I remember what, what the angel told Mary. You remember she, the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and said, you're going to bear a son. And she said, how? And so the angel told her in Luke chapter 1 and verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason, this holy child will be called the Son of God. I remember what the angel told Joseph when he thought, you know, Mary's pregnant, it's not me, what, I'm going to put her away, and the angel told Joseph, no, don't be afraid, she's going to bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he, it is he who will save his people from their sins. And so I think in John chapter 1 and verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. When I contemplate the body of Jesus Christ, I remember John the Baptist in John chapter 1 and verse 29, and he pointed that finger, as Ray was talking about earlier, and he saw Jesus and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. And as Ray read, the, the lamb, that sacrificial lamb, had to be perfect. And that's exactly what Jesus was. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 26. It was fitting for us to have a, such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, 
separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily to offer, uh, like those priests, to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because this he did once for all when he offered himself. When I contemplate the body of Jesus Christ, I remember Isaiah chapter 53. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord caused the iniquity of us to fall on him. When I contemplate the body of Jesus Christ... I remember what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. When I contemplate the body of Jesus Christ, I remember what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds you were healed. When we take that bread, that little cracker, it, it's not just that little dried wafer. Folks, that represents the body that bore your sins and mine on the cross. And Oh, it needs to mean something to us every time we take that. When I reflect upon the blood of Christ, the second part, Jesus took that cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. When I, reflect, or when I reflect on the blood of Christ, I, I think sometimes of the song that we sing sometimes uh, before communion. When I survey the wondrous cross. And verse 3 says, See from his head and his hands and his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. I remember the words of John in John chapter 19. And verses 33 and 34, but coming to Jesus, when they saw that he was already de dead, they didn't break his legs, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately there came out blood and water. Indeed, Jesus bled, but when I contemplate the blood of Christ, oh, you go so much deeper than just that red fluid that flowed out of his body. Now, when you contemplate the blood of Christ, I remember, first of all, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. According to the law, one may almost say that all things are cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And so Jesus, in Matthew 26 and verse 28, he said when he had taken this cup and given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. That's why he shed his blood. When I think of, uh, contemplate the blood of Christ, I remember what Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, knowing that you are not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold from your feudal way of life, inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished, the blood of Christ. When I contemplate the blood of Jesus Christ, I, I think of Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. From Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. And he's made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. It's the blood of Christ that releases us from our sins. I think of Romans chapter 5 and verse 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. To be justified means that, that we're declared innocent. We no longer bear the guilt of our sins. We've been released from those things by his blood. And that's what he says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. How much more will the blood of Christ cleanse your conscience? Who th who, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself with, without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Folks, when we have a guilty conscience, when sin weighs us down, it's the blood of Jesus that can release us from, from those sins, that can cleanse us, that can cleanse our conscience. You remember Peter when he preached that first lesson on the day of Pentecost. He summed it up, and he said, Therefore let all the house of Israel know that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. 
That's how he summed it up. And what was their reaction? You remember that? When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. They had a conscience problem. They were pierced to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter told them, Repent, and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Why would he tell them that? Why would he tell them to repent and be baptized? Well, here's the answer in 1 Peter chapter 3, and verse 21. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, when we're buried in the waters of baptism, we're putting our old man of sin to death, and we're appealing to God to cleanse our conscience, to take that guilt away. And that's what he does, Hebrews 9 and verse 14. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses our conscience. The blood of Jesus Christ is what justifies us and declares us innocent. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that releases us from our sins, and it's the blood of Jesus Christ that was the only thing valuable enough to pay the price. Brethren, and that's the cup that we drink every first day of the week. It's not just a cup of grape juice. It represents the price that was paid to deliver you and I from our sins. That cup that we drink represents the hope of eternal salvation that God has given to us if we are indeed in Christ Jesus. The second criteria that was given was that uh, the memorial had to be harmonious with the site. And so Jesus picked the site where this memorial would be celebrated. In Matthew 26, 27, and 8, I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. That's you and I. We're the kingdom. In Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, the scripture says that they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you've made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they'll reign upon the earth. The blood of Jesus Christ purchased us, and he's made us to be that kingdom here on this earth where we celebrate this memorial. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, the scripture says that he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of our sins. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, uh, Paul says that the church is that blood-bought institution that the elders are charged with caring for. And so we know that on the first day of the week, Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, that the disciples came together with the specific intent of remembering Jesus, of taking this memorial. And Jesus said, when you gather together, I'm going to drink it with you. I'm going to be there with you. Did you ever think about that? That Jesus is here with us when we worship. Can you imagine if you ever saw, if you could just think, you know, if you saw Jesus sitting next to you in the worship service. Can you imagine that? Would, would it change anything about how you worship if you saw the Lord seated at the end of the row? Would you maybe focus a little bit more on, on what's going on in communion? Would you listen to the words of the songs? Would you turn your phone off? Maybe not look at those things, but focus? But that's the whole point. See, Jesus is here with us. He said, we're two or three gathered in my, am, in my name. There I am also. I'm in your midst. Oh, we need to remember that Jesus here is here with us and give him the reverence and the honor and the respect that is due him. The third criteria that was given was the names of the dead and the missing had to be inscribed on the memorial. There's only one name that's on this memorial and it's the Lord's. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 20, he says, therefore when you meet together, is it not to eat the Lord's supper? And again, you remember Jesus said uh, that to do this in remembrance of me. And so when we gather together to, to partake of the Lord's Supper, to remember Him, to remember Jesus, in this memorial we honor the one whose name, we honor the name of Jesus, who said the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. We honor the one who said greater love has no man than this, that one would lay down his life for his friends. 
And Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 17, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one's taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. This commandment I've received from my Father. See, Jesus, when this memorial, we honor him because he voluntarily gave his life. He gave his life for you and I. Nobody forced him. Nobody just took it from him. He laid it down on his own free will. With this memorial, we honor the one who Paul wrote about in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. He said, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. You ever wonder how rich Jesus was? Well, Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, he says, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. That's how rich Jesus was. Equal with God. You know, in the Old Testament, there's never... Uh, a, a description of, of a hierarchy. It's God the Father and God the Son and, and the Holy Spirit. They're just, it's just God. But in the New Testament, now there's God the Father and God the Son. You see, Jesus, equal with God, Paul goes on to say, He became poor. How poor did Jesus become? Well, the rest of that verse, Philippians chapter 2, he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That word that's empty, that, the, the, the meaning is it's like if you take a bucket of water and you just turn it upside down and everything goes out of it. That's what Jesus did when he came to this earth. Folks, he let go of his perfect equality with God for you and I. And some people say, well, what's the big deal? Because he went back to heaven. But he didn't go back to heaven perfectly equal with God. Now there's a hierarchy. Now the scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, Paul says, I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. Jesus said, or the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, that he, Jesus, is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. He upholds all things by the word of his power. When he made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That implies a hierarchy. Jesus said in Matthew 20, 18, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Folks, the one who gives the authority is greater than the one who receives it. There's a hierarchy now. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 27, he has put all things in subjection under his feet, but when he says all things are put in subjection, it's evident that he that is God is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. We could spend a lot more time talking about that, but the bottom line is Jesus Christ emptied himself, gave up his perfect equality with God to redeem us from our sins. And so Philippians chapter 2 and verse 9, it goes on to say, Therefore, for this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Brethren, what a gift Jesus Christ gave to us in letting go of his equality with God and that's the name that's on this memorial that's the name that we honor every time we commune as Christians together the last criteria that was given was the memorial could make no political statement there's only one statement that communion makes and Paul tells us what that is in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 26 he says as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes that word to proclaim means to preach, to herald, to let everyone know. And so when we gather together and we commune together, we're proclaiming to each other 
the death of Jesus Christ. We're proclaiming what Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, that Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. That's what we preach when we commune together, that Jesus Christ took our place. We preach what the writer wrote in Isaiah 53 and verse 10, but the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He'll prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great. He'll divide the booty with the strong because he poured himself out to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and he interceded for the transgressors. That's you and I. That's what we proclaim every time we partake of communion. This sums up this memorial, what we do every first day of the week. We do see him, Jesus, who's been made a little, uh, for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Brethren, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we remember every time we come together to partake of the bread and the fruit of the vine. That Jesus Christ took our place so I don't have to die. So I can live on forever. Oh, may God help us never to, to lose the sense of appreciation and gratitude for what this memorial really means. May it never just be some rote thing where we just go through the motions. Just get it done and move on. But may it be dearer and dearer and dearer to us every time we partake of it, knowing that one day it's going to take us home to be with our Savior. As we close the lesson this morning, I'm going to talk to you just real quick about one other memorial. Some of you may remember what this date is, April the 19th, 1994. That's the day that a bomb went off in front of the federal building downtown Oklahoma City. Tragedy. 168 people died that day. And they built a memorial to honor those victims. If you've never had the chance to go, it's, it's worth visiting. But it meets all four of those criteria that we've just talked about. It is reflective and contemplative. You can see these two big walls kind of on either end. One of them, on, on one end, it, it has the, the numbers 901. That's the minute before the bomb went off. And then on the other end is 903, the minute after the bomb went off. And you can reflect and contemplate how, how life was great and everything was going fine until that minute. And then it changed forever. It is harmonious with the site. It was built on the, on the place where, where the, the federal building used to be. The names of the dead and missing uh, the dead are, are on it. There's 168, you can see on the right side. There are 168 of these, these chairs. They're stone and glass, and each chair has a name on it. And 19 of those chairs are about a third of the size of the others, and they represent the 19 children that were in the daycare that died. It doesn't make a political statement, but it was the mission statement that, that caught my eye and that got my attention. You see, they, the mission statement says, we come here to remember those who were killed, those who survived, and those changed forever. May all who leave here know the impact of violence. May this memorial offer comfort and strength and peace and hope and serenity. You know, we don't have to look too far to know the impact of violence. It seems like every day something new shows up in the news I mean, it, it's bad enough now, it, it almost doesn't shock us anymore, the violence. But so often, the victims of violence, they, it, there's no purpose in their death. 
So oftentimes the victims of violence are a victim because uh, by chance, luck, whatever you want to call it, by fate, they just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And we build these, these memorials to honor people that, that, that so oftentimes lost their life because of fate. They were just there at the wrong place at the wrong time. But brethren, that's not the case with this memorial. The Lord's Supper, the greatest memorial, no, with that memorial, this one, we honor the one who is in exactly the right place at exactly the right time. The scripture tells us in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, when the fullness of time came, when there was just the right time, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order that they might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. And Paul says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 6, while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Brethren, when Jesus came to this earth, it was exactly the right time. And when He hung on the cross... Suspended between heaven and earth, he was in exactly the right place to redeem us from our sins. And so I would end with this. I would change that, that mission statement to say this. May all who leave here this memorial know the impact of sin. You see, sin cost God his only son. Sin cost Jesus Christ his perfect equality with God. And sin costs every one of us eternal life. The Bible tells us in Romans 6 and verse 23 that the wages of sin is death. I know how tragic it would be if that verse ended right there. But don't you see? Because of the memorial that we've just partaken of, because of what that represents, that verse doesn't end there because it goes on to say the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God for that. And so, brethren, the question that you have to ask yourself this morning is, are you in Christ? Have you heard that gospel message? Has it convicted you? Do you believe that Jesus is who he said he is? Do you believe to the point that you're willing to obey him? Have you repented of your sins and confessed Jesus as Lord? Have you been baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins? That's how you get into Christ. Paul said in Galatians 5, 26, 27, or 3, 26, 27, as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. You see, only in Christ does this memorial offer the comfort and strength and peace and hope and serenity knowing that your sins have been forgiven and knowing that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Truly it is the greatest memorial that's ever been given to mankind because it reminds us that God gave his very best. Jesus Christ gave his all. What are you and I willing to give today? If we can help you this morning, would you let us know? Let's stand as we sing this song.